I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. A very special episode of The Truth of the Matter. We have with us an award-winning American filmmaker, Brian Knappenberger, who is the filmmaker behind the forthcoming Netflix docuseries, Turning Point, The Bomb and the Cold War. It's a nine-part series that is coming out on Netflix on March 12th, and we have Brian with us right here. Brian, welcome to the podcast. Thanks a lot for having me. I really appreciate it. So, you know, as a writer and a director and a producer who's covered a variety of topics in previous documentaries, what made you want to focus on the Cold War, which then got into the Ukraine conflict? Yeah, well, we had just started a series about the Cold War, a nine-part series about the Cold War. And I was particularly focused on nuclear weapons and the rapid proliferation of nuclear weapons and where what those threats were today. And we were probably a couple months into this process when Putin invaded Ukraine. And for us, that was that was just a really breathtaking moment. I had already made a film in Ukraine in 2004 about the Orange Revolution. And um, so we're, our, our eyes were glued to the televisions. Uh, you know, that was, I'm sure everybody remembers that tanks were rolling towards Kyiv and uh, there was an assassination attempt on President Zelensky at the time. And Putin was telling a version of the Cold War story himself at the time, only it was riddled with all sorts of factual errors and, and omissions, and occasionally a grain of truth here and there. But he needed to be fact-checked a little bit. And so, you know, That Cold War history, the events, the leaders, the decisions, they were all becoming really, really critically important again. Just as the, you know, the Cold War, facts of the Cold War were fading from from people's minds. And Putin is himself a child of the Cold War. He called the Soviet Union the worst geopolitical, the breakup of the Soviet Union, the worst geopolitical tragedy in all of history. So here we were in the most dramatic way possible, having the Cold War story brought back to the surface, only this time it wasn't a, it wasn't a cold war, it felt like a hot war. And so this history, you know, it just really came to define the way we were looking at that history, which is to say, didn't feel like history anymore. Yeah, history has a way of roaring back into our lives. So given all this, how did you approach making this film? It's obviously very timely. And I want to get to some of the timeliness of it in a minute. You, some of your interviews in this series include with President Zelensky of Ukraine, NATO Secretary Jen Stoltenberg, former CIA Director and Defense Secretary Bob Gates, former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. So you have really some fascinating people in this film. How did you approach this as a filmmaker? That's a good question. Yeah, it was super ambitious. We're looking at 80 plus years of history and we even go back a little a little further than that. And nine episodes seems like a lot, but it but it was very. It, it's not when you think about that that scope. I, you know, we had an incredible team. That this is really the culmination of about a two year effort, worldwide team. We traveled to over seven countries, interviewed over a hundred people. Interviews made it into the series, so there's over a hundred interviews here. But I think to answer your question, I mean, we're really interested in interviewing people who are in the middle of this history, uh, as close as possible to the events of this history. And that included policymakers like you, you mentioned, Robert Gates or Condoleezza Rice or former heads of state, but also historians and academics and researchers and writers try to get this bigger picture look at what the Cold War meant, how those decisions were made, and just, just take us inside that historical mindset. And Ukraine, we spent uh, approximately just under two weeks in Ukraine interviewing officials there, Zelensky, and just talking to people. But, you know, some of the most powerful interviews were people, you know, we in the first episode, we talked to survivors of the Hiroshima bomb. And um, that was that, those were some of the more powerful interviews I've ever I've ever done as a filmmaker. People kind of bring us back to those moments. We talked to somebody whose brother had actually seen the bomb drop out of the out of the plane. Um, he was watching the watching the plane it was this lone plane go across the sky. So. You know, talking through those moments really kind of put the whole thing in perspective and the time we spent in Japan understanding that. We just jumped in and we, you know, we interviewed people as close to uh, and and whose lives were affected by the Cold War. Cold War touched nearly every corner of the planet. And, you know, I think many would argue that 
even though Americans have a bit of a amnesia around the Cold War, it's still affecting us. And some of the people you interviewed even said that we're in a new Cold War in addition to the very real war that's happening with Ukraine. Tell me about those interviews and, and why you think, why those people think we're in a new Cold War. Well, I think that, you know, yeah, we, we look at the early, you, you know, the Cold War was so pervasive. Um, as I mentioned, it just touched, it touched every corner of the planet. It touched nearly every human life. And those events really defined the 20th century and set the stage for where we are now. And I think some of the more interesting, what we realized that the end of the series wasn't going to be the breakup of the Soviet Union. And what we do in this series is we just kind of treat the end of the Soviet Union, the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991, as just another chapter. You know, there's famously a book written called The End of History. Of course, it wasn't the end of history. The history keeps marching forward. And some of those decisions that were made in the 90s set the stage for Putin, for the rise of Putin, for problems, economic problems in Russia in the 90s. And Putin has made his intentions clear pretty much from the moment he stepped on the world stage. And so we just kind of continue to tell those events as they play out with a particular focus on Ukraine, even as back as far back as poisoning of Yushchenko, the Orange Revolution that overturned a fraudulent election there, how those things became protests, eventually the Maidan protests, the famous Maidan protest, the kind of retaliation by Putin by of invading uh, Crimea, and which is really the beginning of the war we're in now. But but all the way up to uh, we're at, we're very close. To, we're just past the two year anniversary of the actual invasion itself. So we we just follow that whole that whole history and try to tell a context and give a context. And when you look at it in the historical perspective, uh, it makes a lot of sense. And so it's it's you know people who are trying to sort of make sense of what's happening now. Uh, it's pretty clear when you look at Cold War tensions. Yeah. So those are some of the pivotal moments during the Cold War. What do you think some of those pivotal moments had the biggest influence on today? Well, as I, you know, as I mentioned, Putin called the breakup of the Soviet Union the greatest geopolitical tragedy in history. And he's, you know, he's talking about a time that the West sees as one of the great moments of history, one of the great successes of history. You know, we we have in our in the series George Bush's State of the Union address where he's, you know, the Cold War is over and we won it. But, you know, those tensions never went away. And Putin is himself driven by Cold War grievances. He is a former KGB. He was stationed in Dresden. He wrote in his memoir, a book about him where he gave an extensive interview, that when the collapse of the Berlin Wall happened, he was looking towards Moscow for direction, for leadership. And the famous line is, Moscow was silent. And he has vowed to not be silent again. So there was this thing, in, this something engendered in him during that period of time that that really is reflected in the way he's he's acting now. And his history is designed to paint Russia as a victim, really justified in taking back or reclaiming Soviet territory, not just the former Soviet Union, but he does have this vision of a. Uh, a Russian empire that maybe even goes beyond that. And his tactics come from the Cold War, threatening the use of nuclear weapons, massive disinformation, misinformation campaigns, both in other countries and in his own, and any attempt to incite chaos in countries he perceives as an enemy, use of toxic weapons to kill political adversaries, heavy use of espionage, e even something like, you know, when you go back in history, you remember the Holodomor, the starvation of Ukraine. So Putin's tactics in Ukraine in the cutting off of grain has a historical reference there, too. So this collapse of the Soviet Union was the beginning of a, of a new and critical kind of chapter here that I think we weren't paying attention to. So certainly the nuclear shadow looms large over all this. What about the Cold War era foreshadows the current state of the world in respect to nuclear weapons? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Nuclear weapons, you know, this is something that's kind of close to me that I, and, and when you look at Cold War history, you know, and, and you sort of string it out this way and you look at it, I mean, you know, for, for a lot of people, one of the more positive aspects of the Cold
was the relative cool headedness and diplomacy between superpowers that we were actually able to achieve some really important nuclear weapons treaties. This was a really big deal. Leaders on both sides, you know, they didn't like each other. They were suspicious of each other, but they realized that if they let fear and hatred get out of control, it would turn into a cataclysm. So they had to find a way to compromise. So, you know, you see early on Cuban Missile Crisis leads to partial nuclear test ban treaty. Then there's the nuclear non-proliferation treaty later in the 60s. Of course, in the 70s, you have the SALT treaties. You have Reagan and Gorbachev in these kind of epic meetings in the 80s floating the idea in Reykjavik of maybe we ban all ballistic missiles entirely. That doesn't happen, but that relationship leads to some important stuff. The INF Treaty in particular, INF Intermediate Range Nuclear weapons, which is a really big deal for Europe, of course, because those are the weapons that hit the hit the big capitals of Europe. That's not the intercontinental ballistic missiles that are aimed at the United States. Those are the more short range ones. So that treaty is a really, really big deal. And it's a it's a it's a it's very important. And of course there's the START treaty. But one of the tragedies of our moment is that even though, you know, the, those treaties have had bipartisan support in the United States for 50 years. And including the INF uh, treaty, which is this enormous accomplishment of Reagan. It was undone by Trump, essentially, who slow rolled the extension of the new START treaty, too. So the Biden administration, when he came in, extended new START within like a few weeks of taking office because it was expiring. But, you know, that's going to that's set to expire. So if we don't have a kind of return to negotiations, to some sort of cool headed negotiations or some sort of diplomatic kind of relations, we we may be looking at the first time in 50 years where there's no limit on the total number of nuclear weapons that the United States and Russia can deploy. So really one of the biggest accomplishments of the, the treaties of the Cold War is a lot of darkness and difficulty in the Cold War, and it affected a lot of people's lives negatively. But one, one of the things that you look at as successes, those successes and accomplishments, those those are on the verge of being gone as well. When you think about the shadow of nuclear war over the current conflict in Ukraine, what were your impressions from interviewing Ukrainian President Zelensky, NATO Secretary Stoltenberg? What are your impressions about that and with respect to nuclear weapons, with respect to the current conflict there? What were your impressions coming out of this film? Well, I guess my impressions are very are almost it's almost an emotional reaction more than anything, you know, because when you're when you're when you're stringing out this history and you're putting this together, you know, you're going through all of this archival footage and you're going through all these big historic moments, and then you're also looking at current what's being you know the rhetoric now that's coming out of Moscow, and you know he's threatening nuclear weapons, he's threatening the use of nuclear weapons, he's saying there's some NATO action or any buildup against him. He's been, in one form or another, he's threatening a an attack like the world has never seen. He uses that kind of language. You also see on Russian television, you see people openly talking about bombing London with graphics and with animations and London being destroyed and, and how this missile or that missile would be enough to just sort of take that all out. So they basically, they should watch out. This is just being openly talked about on television. So that's surprising. You know, when you start looking at that, when you start looking at the translations of Putin's speeches, this is reckless, reckless, reckless kind of talk that you honestly have did not see in the in the Cold War in the same way. You didn't see that even at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis. People were being a little more caught. There's some some rattling, but there wasn't it wasn't the same. It it wasn't the same level of kind of open joking and, and talking about the use of nuclear weapons. We've forgotten how what's at stake here. We've forgotten how fragile this all is. Let's talk about NATO for a second. You did interview Stoltenberg, as we mentioned. There's a lot of talk about NATO, its relevance, whether it's going to continue to exist. Tell me your thoughts there, Brian. Yeah, NATO, that was a, that was really, it's a really interesting topic that we un- unpack in the series. Of course, Trump said recently that he encouraged Putin to attack NATO countries. Uh, obviously, it would be tough to come up with a phrase. Putin would want to hear more than that. But that's incredibly, incredibly reckless. You know, sort of unpack that a little bit. I mean, Putin paints this picture of NATO threatening him. That's sort of his version of the story, that NATO has encroached on his territory. And 
you know, what one of these sort of half truths of history that is, I guess, a hallmark of, of propaganda more than anything, but uh, does have a grain of truth in it is that Putin has said that that the West promised that NATO would move not one inch to the east. That's the phrase he uses, not one inch. But, you know, this is a little this isn't quite true. This com- comes from a conversation between former Secretary of State James Baker and Gorbachev when they're trying to reunify Germany. Berlin Wall falls, and the whole effort is to try to create a new Germany that is unified, that is one country, and that new country is in NATO. That's the effort. And so he's having a conversation with Gorbachev, and he says, well, what if we said Germany was uh, – we, we, we got this. Germany is a country. It's in NATO. And NATO promised not to move not one inch to to the east. So this is a conversation between those two. James Baker goes back to his boss, George H.W. Bush, at president at the time. And President Bush says, no way, absolutely not, completely rejects this. And by the time there are any agreements or any treaties or anything signed, there's no mention of this. In fact, it's the opposite. So there is a little bit of a grain of truth in what Putin is saying there. But there's nothing. This was a notion that was completely rejected. But there is a larger question. Why, why does NATO continue after the end of the Soviet Union? Uh, the Soviet Union is essentially a, you know, the Cold War is in some ways of looking at it as a standoff between the Warsaw Pact countries and, the, and NATO. And the minute the Soviet, the instant that the Soviet Union dissolves, Warsaw Pact is gone, but NATO continues. And I think that's actually a really important question, a, a kind of question to kind of look at. Why, why does it continue? What, why, why, why does it expand? They never invited Russia to be a part of NATO. They never, you know, there's a, there's a lot that could have been done there, I think, and probably some really big missed opportunities early on. Uh, the famous line from George H.W. Bush is, um, if it's not broken, don't fix it. And of course, he's famous for saying, I don't do the vision thing. Well, quite a moment for a president not to do the vision thing. I think they needed some vision there. You know, the, the, so in Putin's mind, NATO continued to be a threat. And if you look at the expansion of NATO, of course, it's expanded quite a bit through the 90s and up, up to today. And Putin's actions have actually exacerbated this, of course, with um, Finland and Sweden. So I think it's an important question. Uh, I, I think there's a, a real need for NATO now, and that's obvious. But when you really look at the history, you wonder about some of the decisions that were made and some of the vision and some of the, I guess, the underestimating of the effect that this would have on uh, the new country, Russia, and 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 just how, how, you know, maybe humiliated they might have been at that moment. In making this film, what's your sense, what are your impressions about Putin's intentions even beyond Ukraine? Do you think he has intentions beyond Ukraine? Yeah, I do. I think Putin does have a grand vision of a Russian empire. That's he talks about this in his speeches. I think we're smart enough now to take him at his word. Most of what he talks about, he pursues and and goes for. So so I think he's not, you know, he's not talking about something that that he's not interested in here. But you know, I think if 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 Russia continues to escalate in Ukraine, or if Putin scores what he thinks is a victory of some sort, then I think there are very real worries that he will continue this and. In particular, I think the most urgent would be the Baltics, right? Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. And in the last couple of weeks, right before this series is about to go live, Putin put one of our interview subjects, Prime Minister Kaja Kala of of Estonia, put put her on a wanted list uh, for the crime of getting rid of or dismantling Soviet-era soldiers' statues in Estonia. And this is this is. This is pretty extreme, um, but it, it does telegraph what he's thinking. Yeah, I mean, he's he's putting a world leader on notice that they're wanted by Russia, a member of NATO. That's right. And keep in mind, Estonia is a an independent country who yeah. can do whatever they want with the statues within their borders. Sure. And also, by the way, Soviet era, there is no more Soviet Union. So this doesn't exist anymore. So this is a maybe it's a symbolic move, but this is a this is a message. And what happens if they do invade Estonia, if Russia does invade Estonia? You, you know, she's on a wanted list. What does that mean? She's a target. 
uh, we were at the forward NATO base in Estonia and I asked the, uh, you know, they, where they, they sort of, they uh, test the, the fighter pilots and they go up in the borders and they, and they kind of uh, circle the borders to sort of protective units that NATO pilots do there. And they were talking about how sometimes the Russian jets would come and test, test them a little bit, you know, test where the borders were. And I said, Oh, what is that? Yeah. What, what does that happen? He's like, Oh, two, two, three times. I said, two, three times a month, the Russian jets test the borders of, of, of Estonia. He said, no, two, three times a week. Two, three times a so, week? That's what he told me. Wow. So that gives you a sense of the, that's, that's the Cold War playing out still. It, it's, it gives you a sense of, of what that kind of jockeying is like. Maybe they're testing for weaknesses. Maybe they're trying to determine something. I, I don't know what it is, but but that tension is very much still alive on that border. We always talk in Washington in national security circles about whether Putin is bluffing or not. You know, obviously you've been over there studying this pretty closely. Is, is, is what's your impression? Is he is he bluffing? Putin's not bluffing. No, I mean I think there's I think that there's a well I, I guess you could say that that he does say quite a bit that has a lot of bluster in it. And, and you wonder at times if a part of that is to increase negotiating potential. So th- I'm sure there's some of that, but, but especially when you do what we've done and, and go through, we track Putin's life through the nineties and where he came from and how he came to power essentially through Yeltsin and, and, and what he's done since he's been in power. And his vision is incredibly consistent. There's not a lot of sort of back and forth here. He's he has had a consistent, clear vision since the since he came into office. So I, in that sense, I don't think he's bluffing when he talks about historical lands or or uh, uh, the Russian Empire or or any of that. I think that's what he that's what he sees. He he talks. I mean, he's he's said, and Dmitry Medvedev has said often that Ukraine's a made up country. That it's not really it's not really a country. It's a part of Russia. That's the way they see it. That's not that's not bluster. Or that's that's the way they see it. Brian, finally, I want to ask you: What do you hope the audience takes away from this docu series? Well, I, I, well, it's a. I hope that there's a greater awareness of the nuclear threat. You know, we forget about this after the the. The Cuban Missile Crisis in the early 60s was also the birth of what you could look at as the modern anti-nuclear movement. And that was very prevalent in the 70s and 80s. And, and I think that since the early 90s, we've mostly thought that this was not a big deal, that this problem had been solved. It's not a it's not, it's not usually at the top of people's list of concerns when they when they think about problems but it's still there and there's still posturing and we're nearly out of all of the you know all of the treaties nuclear treaties have lapsed at this point so this is a danger we we, we still as a human race have weapons that can kill all of us and that's one way of of kind of looking at the cold war this is this is a story about the the reactions and what happens when we've created these weapons that can destroy all of us the way that this kind of forces all this other activity proxy wars and and uh, interfering in other countries and and greater use of espionage and and intelligence services and and all sorts of misinformation and, and disinformation it sort of forces these tensions into all these other ways and that's the, that's the world that we that we currently live in but that's a result of nuclear weapons so i, I hope people have a greater awareness of that but i also you know I, 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 I do have a more hopeful look too. That when it comes to democracy, and when it comes, there are there are things that are important, and and there are things that are worth fighting for. And you know, we're seeing that play out in Ukraine now. You know, liberal democracy and freedom it has been challenged by authoritarianism before, and we've kind of come through it. We're in a new moment now the dangers are very high the information the way we get information is very different uh, than it used to be but the battle is the same and there there are things about democracy and about you know the experiment of democracy that is that are really important democracy is fragile and it really only survives 
if we believe in it. It's only as powerful as we believe it is, as our belief in it. The minute we kind of give up on it, it is, it's gone. And so to some degree, I think that's what Putin is trying to bring to the United States through disinformation campaigns and interference in social media and things like that. He's trying to bring cynicism and division to this country. That's what he's trying to do. If we don't believe in our democratic institutions, if we don't believe in the things that created this country, and or maybe they weren't a good idea in the first place. And he turns us against each other by amplifying the most extreme voices on both sides. So we have this cacophonous feeling like we're trapped in this chaos. If he if we don't believe in our system and we turn on each other, then he's struck a devastating blow to this country without um firing a shot or dropping a single weapon. The docuseries Turning Point, The Bomb and the Cold War, comes out next week on Netflix on March 12th. Brian Knappenberger is the filmmaker behind this project. Brian, thank you for being here today and sharing some about this film. Can't wait to see it. Of course. Thank you very much for for having me. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts. From Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 